Welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Rasha Busita, the Sustainability Program Coordinator at Emerge Guelph, and I would like to begin with the Aboriginal land acknowledgement. I want to acknowledge as we gather here today, we are reminded that Guelph is situated on a treaty land that is steeped in rich indigenous history and home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people today. As a community, we have the responsibility for the stewardship of the land on which we live and work and a responsibility to foster reconciliation and respect for indigenous people who have been stewards and caretakers for this land for generations. Today, we acknowledge the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation of the Anishinaabe peoples on whose traditional territory we are meeting today. And we encourage folks to continue educating themselves on all current issues first, uh, facing First Nation communities and peoples across Ontario and Canada, and to learn how to take action to uplift and support Indigenous people from cause to cause to cause. Thank you. And uh, next, this is the agenda for tonight. I would like to thank uh, our local bookstore, The Bookshelf, for sponsoring this event. And uh, Catherine's book will be available in the bookstore. Uh, so if you are interested, you can uh, uh, get it access accessible and uh, have a look at the book. Next, I would like to introduce our executive director, Evan Ferrari, to give his uh, brief introduction about Emerge and uh, climate change. Over to you, Evan. Thank you. Thanks, Rasha. Um, I'm going to give you just a really brief introduction to, to Emerge, but I just want to say that this event tonight is much more than a local Guelph event. Uh, it's gone a, a little viral, not only throughout the province of Ontario with other environmental, non-governmental organizations, but with uh, climate change practitioners across the country, uh, with, um, uh, um, with academics, both in Canada, in the United States, and even some people from the European Union. Uh, our organization, our not-for-profit, um, Emerge Guelph Fights Climate Change. And how we do it is we do it within the narrative of getting the city, and we've actually got the city to commit to 100% renewable energy by 2050. If we can just advance the slide there, please. Um, but um, this narrative under, when, when we first mention 100% renewable to people, people inevitably think all we have to do is stick renewables on our vehicles, on our, on our homes, et cetera, and we've solved the problem. But frankly, that's not what this is. That's not what this is about. In, in any way, shape, or form. What it is about is about dealing with the two thirds of energy that we waste in Canada every year. And until we wrestle that piece to the, to the, uh, to the ground, it's extremely difficult for us to actually get to that 100% renewable energy target long before uh, 2050. And essentially how we get there is that through efficiency and conservation and, uh, and aggressive efficiency and conservation, both in, in, not only in our community, but throughout the province as well. If all we did was to put those solar panels on these homes, we're never going to reach, uh, reach net zero or 100% or renewable energy, because if we build homes, even just based on the current building code, on to the next slide, we would need to put solar panels on three homes for the energy consumed in every one home. Thankfully, the homes that are in this picture are net zero homes. The energy used in those, those homes or those that's needed in those homes is significantly less than the, uh, uh, than, than the building code. And they're able to actually reach that 100% renewable, renewable energy piece. Ultimately, we, mean, we need to get to a place where we're heating homes in Guelph and throughout Ontario with the equivalent amount of energy of three TVs. Let that one seep in for a second. Three televisions, the energy consumed by three te televisions in a given year. You can come back for another talk later on when we, get, when, when we, uh, when we dig deep into that whole piece about heating a home with, uh, with three TVs. 
Um, and briefly, I would just want to mention another event. This is our first uh, uh, public announcement of it, and it shouldn't be me actually saying it. It should probably be Russia, but coming up March 8th during International Women's Day, we'll be having our second Women's Electric Vehicle Night, and this is for EV curious women. We're going to have three experts uh, on a panel uh, that night, including Kara Klarman, the, um, uh, the uh, chief executive officer at Plug and Share. Um, she's one of the, the, the leading um, electric vehicle experts uh, in the country. Sorry. And um, I suspect that we're all here this evening because we're having trouble communicating. No, this isn't meant to be a couples therapy session by any means. We're here because the problem we jointly face is something that affects us pro pro profoundly. It affects us in what we do uh, as individual citizens or practitioners in the field of fighting climate change. How can we communicate in a way that accelerates climate change mitigation and adaptation? We've all been guilty of assuming that if we could only present more data, that it would convince others that climate change is not only real, but also a threat to our very existence. We clearly haven't been successful with that approach. Catherine's accomplishments are so significant that I feel compelled to dig down deep into some of these. She's an accomplished atmospheric scientist who studies climate change and why it matters to us and now. She's also a remarkable communicator who has received the National Center for Science Education's Friend of the Planet Award, the American Geophysical Union's Climate Communication Prize, the Sierra Club's Distinguished Service Award, and been named to a number of lists, including, this one's buried in, 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 in her bio, if you can imagine, uh, Time Magazine's 100 Most um, Influential People and also Foreign Policy's 100 Leading Thinkers, Fortune Magazine's World's Greatest Leaders, and the United Nations Champion of Earth in Science and Innovation. Her writing has appeared in a broad range of outlets, including the New York Times, Wired, O Magazine, Chatelaine here in Canada. Her TED Talk, The Most Important Thing You Can Do to Fight Climate Change, Talk About It, has nearly 4 million views in her most recent book. Let me grab it here. Saving Us, if you haven't read it or if you haven't picked it up yet, it's also available at the bookshelf here in Guelph. Um, a Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World, and available right here. Catherine has served as lead author on the second, third, and fourth national climate assessments. She also hosts and produces PBS digital series, Global Weirding, and serves on advisory committees for a broad range of organizations, including the Smithsonian Natural History Museum, the Earth Science Women's Network and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Catherine serves as chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy, that's the American version. In Canada, we call it the Na uh, Nature Conservancy Canada or NCC. And she is also a Paul W. Horn Distinguished Professor and the Political Science Endowed Professor in Public Policy and Public Law at Texas Tech University. She has a B BSc in Physics from the Uni uh, University of Toronto, her hometown. Welcome back to Ontario, by the way, Catherine, and an MS and PhD in atmospheric science from the University of Illinois, and has been awarded the on an honorary doctorate from Colgate University and Victoria University at the University of Toronto. Catherine, welcome virtually back to Canada and to here to Guelph tonight. And thanks for joining us. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you so much, Evan. It is great to be with you here today. So yes, I am from Etobicoke, to be very specific. I'm graduated from U of T. Um, went south for graduate school, and if you know a hey-ho, the answer is yes, they are a relative. <laughs> There's a fair amount of hey-hos around in southern Ontario, and they are all some form of cousin. So I am delighted to be with you here talking about my favorite topic, which is climate change. And the reason why I'm a climate scientist is because of a class I took at U of T. So I was well on my way to finishing my undergrad degree in astronomy and physics, and I was planning to be an astrophysicist. In fact, I don't know if you've seen that Netflix movie, Don't Look Up, but it opens with a graduate student named Kate, which of course is a variation of my own name, sitting in a telescope dome taking observations. And it was so eerie because I felt like that was me. I used to do exactly that. And then she discovers something that's gonna possibly end the world as we know it. And she tries to tell people about it. Nobody wants to listen. I'm like, that's me too. <laughs> <laughs> Except I'm doing it for climate change, and here's the difference. The difference is that it is not too late. 
and I'm going to do everything I can. I'm not gonna go off and get a, a job in a grocery store. I'm gonna keep on telling people that we can fix it because I know that we can avoid the worst. So I love the title of today and um, we're gonna talk to each other as we go. So if you, and, and um, they're gonna put a link in the chat too if you wanna click on it. If you go to polev.com slash Catherine, that is P-O-L-L-E-V dot com slash my name, spelled with two A's. If you go there, you're gonna get a chance to put your questions there while I'm talking and you're gonna get a chance to upvote the questions that are most interesting for us to get to at the end. But before you ask me questions, I wanna ask you a few questions so you get familiar with the tool. So first of all, I want you to tell me where are you joining us from tonight? Now, originally I had just put Southern Ontario on here, but when Evan said that people are joining from all over, I quickly expanded this to Canada. And if you are not in Canada, that's totally fine. What you wanna do is you wanna click off the map like down below if you're in the United States or over here if you're over in Europe or up here if you're in Alaska, you can click wherever you want on this map to show us where you're joining from today. So like I said, I was expecting a few from Southern Ontario, but it looks like, oh, we already got, got one from over there in Alberta, one from sort of middle of Ontario there up north. So far, nobody's admitting, oh, there's somebody just south of the border, all right, okay. A few more from around Ontario, oh, up there in the Ottawa area. You can kind of get the hang of it now, right? I know it's a little hard if you're on your phone, you're gonna to have to click with your finger. Okay. Oh, somebody from BC is joining us. Excellent. Somebody from Greenland has joined us, or maybe that was just an accident there. <laughs> All right. So now, now I have another question for you. And this next question is a little trickier. You have to answer it with one word. Not two words, not three words, just one word. Now, if you have to use multiple words, put a dot or a dash in between them. So for example, if your answer to this question, and this will make sense in a second, but if your answer to this next question is father-in-law, you would wanna do father-in-law all one word or do father dot in dot law, but don't put them as separate words. Why is that? Because it's a wordle. And this is the next question for you. I find it most difficult to talk about climate change with who? Who do you find it most difficult to talk about climate change with? And again, give me one word or put a dot in between if you need, like my kids, then you could put like my dot kids. Okay. I find it most difficult to talk about climate change with who? With my parents, my family, with my in-laws, with conservatives, with young parents, with uh, uninformed, with um, someone I meet at church, with coworkers, with right-wingers, with deniers, with most people, that's very honest, <laughs> most people. Um, oh, brother-in-law is in there, yep. Um, coworkers, neighbors, friends, nobody. Okay, somebody said nobody, that's great. Peers, Midwesterners. Father, let's see who else we have here. The uninformed, the overeducated. <laughs> okay, so we've got conservatives, family, parents, and friends sort of emerging here with coworkers a close second. All right, don't worry, we're gonna talk about this. Now, what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to open up the questions and here's how questions work. At any time throughout my presentation, whenever a question occurs to you, you can go back here and you can type your question in. Even if you don't have a question though, this is why you might wanna go here. You might wanna go here because, just a second here, let me open it up, because you can look at everybody else's questions and you can upvote the questions you most want me to answer. We're not gonna have time at the end to answer all the questions because I typically get way too many questions than I can answer, but you can upvote the ones you most want me to get to and that way we'll be sure to get to those questions. So at any time through the presentation, this is gonna be open the whole time, you can go in here, you can write your own question, you can check out what other questions people are putting up and you can upvote the questions you most want me to answer. But let me get started before you do that. All right, just a second here. There we go. I love your title. The title is Talk As If Climate Change Matters. So I wanted to sort of walk through things that people might say in response to this title. And the first thing people might say is, 
Well, why does climate change matter? Now, of course, climate change matters to you. That's why you're here. But why it matters to you might be different than why it matters to the person you're trying to talk to. Why it matters to them might be different than the reason it's, it matters to me. We all have different reasons we care, and that is totally fine. And when we realize that we can all have different reasons, that's the first step to effective conversations. What do I mean by that? Well, often we think to care about climate change, we have to be a certain type of person. And this is what I thought when I first took that class on climate change at U of T. I thought that to care about climate change, you need to be an environmentalist or David Suzuki or, you know, the next David Suzuki. And if you're that type of person, you're the one who works on climate change and everybody else sort of supports you and wishes you well. Well, it turns out that yes, if you are an environmentalist, you do care about climate change. But to care about climate change, you don't have to be only an environmentalist because climate change matters to everyone. When you look at what is happening to our planet, when we scientists look back as far as we can in the history of the Earth, we see that we are conducting a truly unprecedented experiment with the only home we have. We have never had this much carbon going into the atmosphere this quickly. Even as far back as we can go, 55 million years ago to the time of the greatest change that we can see in the paleoclimate record, it's estimated only a tenth of the carbon was going into the atmosphere per year at that time as we humans are putting in today. So we are truly conducting an unprecedented experiment with what? With our home, the place where every single one of us lives. This home gives us the water we drink and we cannot survive without water. It gives us the air that we breathe and we cannot survive without that air. It gives us the food that we eat and we cannot survive without that food. You see where I'm going here, right? It gives us everything we use to make everything we have. All of our infrastructure, all the goods that power our economy, everything we have is made from things we get from this planet, right? Climate change is not only an environmental issue, climate change is an everything issue. It quite literally affects our infrastructure, our economy, our energy. It affects our water, our natural resources, and our health. It affects our food, our biodiversity, and our conservation. And it affects issues of justice and equity. Climate change is profoundly unfair. Climate change is at its core a human issue. It affects every single one of us, but it affects those who have done the least to cause this problem the most. And that's true whether it's homeless people living on the, city of, on the streets of Toronto or whether it's small shareholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa. Climate change is not only an everything issue, it is also a here and a now issue. And I have to admit, I'm going to have to turn off the pictures there because I'm getting slightly distracted because I see somebody doing exactly what I usually do when I'm listening to meetings online. I have a basket right beside me with my knitting in it. <laughs> and I usually knit when I'm in meetings online too. <laughs> but I can't knit while I'm speaking to you. So let me, let me turn off that so I won't get distracted wanting to know what people are doing, which is awesome. Um, I find it easier to concentrate actually when I'm doing that because it keeps my hands busy. So what is climate change doing to us? It is affecting us here and now by loading the weather dice against us. It's taking our droughts and making them stronger, lasting longer. It is making our heat waves much more intense. Our wildfires burn greater area and our storms are stronger and they dump a lot more rainfall than they would have otherwise. It's literally as if wherever we live, we have a pair of dice and we always have a chance of rolling a double six naturally. We've always had storms and wildfires and floods and heat waves naturally, but decade by decade by decade, as the planet warms, it's like it's sneaking in and taking one of these numbers and turning it into a six, and then taking another number and turning it into a six, and then taking one more, another number and turning it into a seven. And then we're like, how could you have, you know, heat waves over you know, at 50 degrees Celsius in Canada? How could you have three 500 year flood events in three years? How could this happen? It's happening because climate change is loading the weather dice against us. And we scientists are starting to put numbers on just how much worse climate change is making these events. 
we know that the Western heat wave was at least 150 times more likely, the BC heat wave this past summer, because of climate change. We know that the crazy wildfire season two years ago burned seven times the area because climate change was loading the weather dice against us. We haven't crunched the numbers for the wildfire for this past year yet. We know that Hurricane Harvey cost four times as much because climate change supersized the hurricane. We know that climate change is making atmospheric rivers stronger and more intense. We all know what those are now thanks to the crazy floods that hit the west coast this past fall. There are rivers of water vapor in the sky that when they reach the west coast of North America and they hit the mountains, that air starts to rise and as it rises, the water condenses and falls. And what happens when that happens? We see record floods. We've never had a flood like this before. Why? Have they had atmospheric rivers before? 100%. They're natural phenomena. But they didn't have them that strong and with that much water vapor in them because they're being supersized by a warmer ocean. So often we think to care about climate change, I have to be this person or these people or this one or possibly just a polar bear. But the reality is to care about climate change, you know who we have to be? All we have to be is exactly who we already are. In fact, I say this so often that someone literally took a marker and wrote it on a t-shirt and sent me a picture of it. And this is what she's, she did. As I often say, we don't have to be a liberal or an NDP or a green tree hugger to care about a changing climate, although if we are, we certainly do. All we have to be is a human being living on this planet. So people said they had problems talking to conservatives about climate change, and I understand that. But we don't have to make them not conservative before they care about climate change. All we have to do is show them that if they're truly conservative, they're the perfect person to care about climate change. So by recognizing that who we already are is the perfect person to care, by recognizing that it's not about saving the planet itself, it will be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. It is quite literally about saving us, us humans and many of the living things that share this planet with us all of a sudden, there's a lot of stresses that evaporate. Like what? Gone is the need to convince everyone to care for the same reason we do. Gone is the drive to recruit people to our tribe, so to speak. Gone is our motivation to coerce or guilt or shame others into acting as if they don't have any reason to act other than how others see them. Instead, we can show people that whoever they already are is the perfect person to care about and act on climate change. And in fact, by doing so, they can be an even more genuine expression of the values they already have. And if someone doesn't realize this, because I know there's a lot of people who don't, our job is not to change who they are, but to find out who, what, where they already love, and then help them connect the dots to how climate change affects that and how climate, change, climate action benefits that. Let me give you an example. I was um, reading the audio version of my book to record it last August, just before the book came out in September. And I was doing it over a weekend in a local studio here where the owner of the studio actually came in to be the producer while I was reading the book. And after I'd finished the first two or three hours of reading and I came out to take a break and rest my voice and get a drink of water, he said, I didn't realize your book was about climate change. I have some questions. Now, I live in West Texas where a lot of people have questions about climate change and they're not on board. And it was very clear he was in this camp. So I sat down. I said, sure, I'd be happy to chat with you about it. So we sat down while I had a, had a glass of water and he started to ask me some questions and I started to ask him some questions. What questions did I ask him? How long have you lived here? What changes have you seen when you've been in Lubbock? What do you love doing? Oh, fishing? Tell me about that. Oh, he'd been going there since he was a child. He'd seen all kinds of changes happening. The water was getting warmer and more polluted and it was getting much more developed. And he loves skiing too. And I said, oh, I do too. So what have you seen there? Oh, well, we've had some terrible seasons lately with not a lot of snow and it's definitely not the way it used to be. So before he knew it, he was telling me how climate change was affecting him, even though he wouldn't have used those words. 
Whoever someone is, 99 times out of 100, they are already the perfect person to care, and all we have to do is help them see that. So that's why we care. But then you might say, or you might be thinking, or you might talk to somebody who says, talk? We don't need more talk. We need action. Well, of course we need action. I completely agree with that. But how do we spur action? If we don't talk about something, why would anybody care? And if nobody cares, why would they want to do anything about it? And how could they do anything about it if they don't even know what to do? Talking is not sufficient, but it is necessary. I think of talking as knocking over the first domino. That's what talking is. It's knocking over that first domino that leads to action. And you know what? We're actually not doing it. So this is a series of maps from the Yale Program on Climate Communication. And they have a few of these maps for Canada, but they don't have the second one I'm going to show you. So that's why I'm going to show you the US ones to make the point. But all the ones they have for Canada look very similar to the American ones, trust me. Sadly, they don't look that different. If you ask people, is global warming happening? Most people say yes. But then if you ask people, do you ever talk about it even once in a while? Look at this map. The answer is no. We aren't even talking about it. Why not? Well, there's a couple of reasons when I've asked people why they're not talking about it. Reason number one, I'm afraid it would start an argument. I have yet to find a picture of two heads exploding, but that might be even more accurate. That's reason number one. And yeah, I wouldn't want to start a conversation that ends like this either. Reason number two, everyone thinks the same way I do that I know, so what's the point of talking about it? Well, if you don't talk about it, how do you know they think the same way you do, right? And there's even more reasons later on that we'll get to. But that's reason number two. And then reason number three is, it is just completely depressing. Why would I want to talk about something when there's nothing we can do about it anyways? We don't talk about it often because we don't understand how it connects to us personally. We don't know how to communicate why it matters to other people personally. And we don't understand what we can do about it, so we self silence. And when we self silence, we just become even more anxious and even more depressed and even more paralyzed than we were before. Talking opens the floodgates, so to speak. Talking knocks over that first domino to action. Talking invokes something that so social scientists call social norms that are eventually what completely change our society. When we talk, and I put an asterisk on talking there because it isn't just necessarily using your mouth to form words, right? When we post on social media, that's talking. When we share things, that's talking. When we do things where other people see us doing them, that's a form of talking too or communicating, right? So in other words, what does communicating with others affect? It affects who we see ourselves as because we talk about what matters to us. It massively affects what other people around us think because where do we form our opinions on based on what we hear, the input we get? This changes what they call our social norms, which are ideas of what is and is not acceptable in our society today. And this in turn changes our sense of efficacy. If I do something, could I make a difference? And if we think we could make a difference, then we're willing to do something. This is a cascading chain that kicks off with what? with communication. So this is George Marshall. I like to show you pictures of people when I talk about them so you know who they are. George Marshall is a Brit and he has a very dry sense of humor. When I was reading his book, Don't Even Think About It, How Our Brains Are Wired to Ignore Climate Change, I was reading some of it in public and I was actually laughing out loud and trying not to snort too loudly because there were some very funny lines in it. But he understands really how our brains are wired and why communication is so important. And so a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to George because we were working together on an action website for the new Netflix movie, Don't Look Up. Have you seen that movie? That's that movie that I talked about again that begins with a young um, graduate student who's an astronomer who's sitting in the telescope dome, right? And she discovers there's a comet headed for Earth, which was, you know, exactly what I was doing when I was her age minus the comet part. So we were working with Netflix to create this fantastic 
um, website, and I will drop a link to that website in the chat when we're done because I would love for you to check it out, um, about what are the most effective actions that people can do. And guess what the most effective action is that we persuaded them it is? It's talking about it. And the second one is joining an organization to amplify your voice, calling for action. So in the course of talking to George, he said some really good things that I wanted to share with you just recently. And he said, talk is the fertile field in which cultural change begins. Here's the important part. In its absence, it is impossible for a group of people to solve a problem. How are you gonna to work together to solve a problem if you never talk about it? How did you persuade the city to have a 100% clean energy goal? Communication, right? Talking is the first step. Conversations, he went on to say, underpin all climate action. Where people choose to invest their money, what party they vote for, what energy source they use at home. All of these actions begin with what? Conversations. Having conversations about climate change in our daily lives plays a huge role in creating social change. We take our cues about what's important from what we hear from our family, our friends, our colleagues, our neighbors. And here's how he concluded, and this is really important. What's the goal? The goal is not to tell people about climate change. The goal is to expand the number of people who are in the conversation. Isn't that a little different? Not to tell them about it, but to bring them in. Not to push them, but to pull them in to the conversation. So I did my TED Talk a couple of years ago called The Most Important Thing You Can Do to Fight Climate Change is Talk About It. And I truly believe it was. But I didn't even have the best example when I did that. I did my talk and it was released in December. And the following May, so five and a half months later, I was doing one of my bundled trips to the UK. And my bundled trips, if you know, if you've read my book, Saving Us, are when I don't travel unless I have saved up enough invitations. So if I go somewhere, I'm doing multiple events in one place. And my, my goal is always to have um, so many events in one place that the carbon footprint of traveling there is equivalent to if I took my little plug-in hatchback car and drove there and back from where I live, you know, about an hour away. I don't always hit quite that goal, but I get pretty darn close. So I was in the UK and I was based in London taking a train out to do all these different events. Like, you know, some days, in fact, the day I'm telling you about, I think I had about seven or eight events in a single day. It started first thing in the morning with a breakfast and it went until evening. And the last event of that evening was a lecture at the London School of Economics. So I gave this talk and at that point I was exhausted. I just wanted to, you know, go home, put my feet up and have a cup of tea. But as I was walking out the door of this auditorium, I noticed this older man sort of standing there, obviously waiting to speak to me. So I stopped and he greeted me and introduced myself, himself. And he said, I just want to let you know that I watched your TED talk and it completely changed my approach. I live in the borough of Wandsworth, which is a suburb of London, and I had been working on climate action in Wandsworth. I had been trying to get our city council to, to take climate action for a long time and nothing was happening. So when I saw your TED talk, a light bulb went off. I realized I needed to be having conversations with everybody about this. So he said, that's what I've been doing for the last five months. And if you're interested, I have a list of all the conversations that I've had in the last five months. Would you like to see it? And so I thought to myself, well, this is new. I've never heard anybody have a list of their conversations before. So I said, sure. So here he is, that's Glenn. And he reached in his bag and he pulled out a stack of paper with 10 thousand names on it. These were not 10,000 people who signed a petition. They were 10,000 people who had had climate conversations in a single borough of London with about 180,000 people in it. And because of that, their city council had just voted to declare a climate emergency because so many people had been talking about it. And a year later, they, they voted to invest 20 million pounds into a climate resilience strategy. And it all began with the conversation. Isn't that amazing? So that's why talking matters, and that's why climate change matters. But the next question people often say is, well, what should I be talking about? I mean, I'm not a scientist. That's okay, because science is really one of the least helpful things that you can be talking about. All too often, we take this approach though. Climate changes and we get worried, and we look around and we say, well, nobody else is as worried as they should be. Nobody's acting like they should be. I'm gonna load up 
on all of the fear-based facts, all of the scary data points I can find, and believe me, there are a lot of true scary data points. I'm a scientist, I could give them to you all. I'm gonna load up on all the scary facts and I'm going to dump them on people. If they aren't worried now, they will be when I'm done with them. Well, here's the problem. As humans, our brains are literally wired such that fear without the ability to respond appropriately paralyzes us. And so if we don't know what to do with this information we've been given, it just causes us to go back to bed and pull the blankets up over our head, so to speak. And the result is not action, the result is inaction. Tally Sherratt is a neuroscientist. She wrote a really good book called The Influential Mind. And she says this, not speaking about climate change, just speaking about the way our brain works. Fear and anxiety will cause us to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than take action. And so when we just dump fear-based facts on people, what does it do? It just paralyzes them even more. Oh, well, if that's not what I'm supposed to talk about then, what do we talk about? Well, if we understand what the barriers are that are keeping people from acting, that's what we can address when we have our conversations. And it's, if we look at how people already feel about climate change, it turns out that in Canada, over 75% of us are already worried about climate change. In the United States, over 70% are already worried about climate change. So most of us are already worried. And then, and this data is for the United States, I'm sorry, I don't have the similar data for Canada, but you know, it's not that different. In the United States, 50% of people surveyed feel hopeless and don't know where to start. So they're worried, but they don't know what to do about it. And you know how many people are actually activated? Take a guess in your mind. What percentage of people do you think are activated? In Canada, mm, I'm willing to guess maybe 12% in Canada, but in the US it's 8%. So the biggest gap we have is not between the people who say it is real and the people who say it isn't. The biggest gap we have is between the people who are dead worried about it, but they're not doing anything. Why not? Because they don't know what to do. So that gives us a clue about what we can talk about, right? We need to understand and we need to explain to people why it matters here and now and what we can do to fix it. This is what we can talk about. And who's the perfect person to talk about this? You, not me, you. Scientists are number two on the list of most trusted messengers. Who's number one? Friends and family and people we know. So how do we tackle these two issues? Why it matters and what we can do about it. We all fall victim to something called psychological distance. We see risks as being far away from us in time or space abstract rather than concrete or irrelevant to our primary concerns. And that's why we eat that extra Tim Hortons donut. And that's why we don't exercise as much as we should. And that's why we might not be saving as much as we need to for retirement, because we see these risks as being distant and far off. Well, when it comes to climate change, all of these risks are, all of these risks of psychological distance are there in spades. And again, I'm gonna show you these maps for the US. They have a few of these for Canada and I'll put the, the link for Canada in the chat afterwards, but they don't quite have the sequence I wanna show you. So that's why I'm showing you these ones. But again, the versions of these ones that they have for Canada are pretty much the same. So is global warming happening? We looked at this before. Sure, it's happening. Is it going to harm plants and animals, non-human species? Distant how? In relevance. Sure. Is it going to harm future generations? Distant how? In time, yes. Is it going to harm people in developing countries? Distant in space, yes. Is it going to harm you? And believe me, if we said this, we don't have this map for Canada, but if we did, my guess is it might be even darker blue, except for the Vancouver area right now. Why? Because we're like, oh, Canada, it's a cold country. Longer summer, that's great. I had somebody say that just today on my Facebook page. On my Facebook page, I put something called the warming stripes, which shows how the planet has been warming and how Canada itself has been warming. Let me see if I can show you that here. Um, da -da -da -da. If you go to my Facebook page, you can see, yes, here it is. 
um, you can see that um, I put these great little maps that are these great little figures there and each bar is a year and you can see that over time we're getting warmer and warmer and somebody commented on my post on my Facebook page and they said oh but isn't it great the can is getting warmer and I said well sure it is great as long as you don't mind killer heat waves massive wildfires invasive species thawing permafrost <laughs> rising sea levels <laughs> As long as you don't mind that stuff, yes, it's great. So what do we need to do? We need to talk about how climate change is affecting us here and now in ways that are relevant to our lives. And in my book, I talk about that a lot. I talk about how I was giving a talk in Washington, D.C. a couple years ago, and um, one guy who's a postdoc at NASA came up to me afterwards and he said, I'm really worried about climate change, but I don't know how to talk about it to my friends. So I said, what do you like doing with your friends? And he said, well, we enjoy cooking together. I said, well, there you go. Start by talking about how climate change is affecting food. It affects specialty crops like chocolate and coffee and beer and wine. It affects the nutritional quantity, quality of food, which affects people, especially in low-income countries. Just talk about food. And then at the same event, a young woman came up to me and she said, I want to talk about this with my grandma, but I don't know where to start. I said, well, what do you do with your grandma? And she said, we knit together. See, knitting came up again. And I said, well, I have the perfect thing for you to do. You can take those warming stripes that I just showed you. You can get them for Canada or you can get them for Ontario or you can get them for any province you want. And I'll put a link to this also in the chat when we're done. There'll be a lot of links there for you to look at. You can get that as a knitting pattern and you can knit a scarf and then you can wear it and people say, oh, what is that? And you can explain what it is. You can also get like a men's tie. You can get a mask with the warming stripes on it. You can get all kinds of things to start those conversations. So start the conversation with something that people have in common, connect the dots to climate change, and then we need the other half of this. Why it matters and what we can do to fix it. Why is this important? Because three quarters of us are already worried, but we don't know what to do to fix it. We have a stunning lack of efficacy. Efficacy is the concept that if I do something, will it make a difference? And today, most of us would say no. We don't think anything we do can make a difference. How can we help people grow efficacy? How can we foster efficacy? How can we build efficacy? By showing people that our actions really do make a difference. By showing people that the giant boulder of climate change is not sitting at the bottom of an impossibly steep cliff, it's already rolling down the hill in the right direction. We tackle these issues by starting with the one thing we're not doing, talking about why it matters and about what we can do to fix it. And again, most people don't think it matters and most people are not talking about it. So we're right back to talking and why talking matters. But again, it's not about dumping the scary facts on people. It's about talking about how climate change affects us and what we can do to fix it. We can talk about how climate change affects our water, our food, the safety of our homes, our economy, our health. I was in um, Iowa a little while ago and somebody said, how do you talk about polar bears in Iowa? And I said, you don't. If you're in Texas, where I live, you talk about cotton farming. If you're in California, you talk about wildfires. And if you're in British Columbia. And frankly, if you're in almost anywhere in Canada, because we had that smoke all through Southern Ontario last summer. If you're in Vancouver, you talk about floods. If you're in a big city, you talk about our health and air pollution and flooding and heat waves. You don't talk about something that isn't relevant where you live. You talk about what's happening and how it affects people where you are. So talk about how climate change affects us and then talk about what we can do to fix it. Now there's actions at every level. And we often think, first of all, about our personal actions, our carbon footprint. But there's something that's even more important than our carbon footprint, and that's our climate shadow. That's how we interact with other people around us. And how do we do that? Through communication. Personal actions matter, but when you take a personal action, what matters even more is when you talk about it. So just before the pandemic, in fact, I think one of my last talks before the pandemic shut us all down was um, at a church called The Meeting House, which you might have heard of because it's a big church all across Southern Ontario. 
And um, there's about 19 different campuses, including one in Guelph. And I was speaking at the one in Oakville at the time. And I was talking about how climate change affects all of us. And I, was, I began with talking about how if we are a Christian, and this is actually true of it, any major world uh, uh, tradition or religious tradition, but if we're a Christian, then we're the perfect person to care about climate change because we believe that we are, have responsibility over every living thing on this planet. We believe we are to love and care for those less fortunate than us, the very ones most affected by climate change. And I talked about, again, how climate change is affecting us in Southern Ontario and what we can do to fix it. And I gave personal examples and I gave um, examples of cities, examples of companies, examples of what the province is doing, what the states are doing and down in the states, what the countries are doing. And as people were leaving, I was standing by the door of the church, sort of eavesdropping. And I heard one woman talking to her friend and she said, I've always been worried about climate change, but I didn't know what to do. So I did nothing. But now I know what to do. I just learned how food waste is a huge source of heat trapping gas emissions. And in Canada, we waste over 50% of the food we produce. So we're going to eat the Christmas leftovers and that's how we're going to start. What's the best thing to do about climate change? Anything and talk about it. So I love telling people what countries are doing like Ireland and Finland and of course our own country of Canada. I love telling people what corporations are doing that often surprises them. I love telling people what communities are doing, whether it's army bases in the US or churches or people working on pollinator friendly plants in solar fields. I love talking about what young people are doing. They're really leading the way. I love talking about the changes I've made in my personal life, our solar panels, my plug in car, how we've changed our diet and our light bulbs. I love talking about what's happening around the world, how last year, 90% of new energy installed around the world, some of it in some of the poorest places in the world that don't have a lot of fossil fuels, but they have a lot of sun and a lot of wind, 90% of that energy was clean energy last year. The world really is changing. That giant boulder of climate action is not sitting at the bottom of the hill with only a few hands on it. And if you add yours, it won't budge. When we look around at everything that's happening, when we share that with other people, we realize that giant boulder is already at the top of the hill. It is already rolling down the hill in the right direction. It already has millions of hands on it. And if you add yours, it will go a little bit faster. And if we add ours together by using our voice to encourage others to act as our place of work, as our neighborhood, as our school, as our organization or group, it will go even faster. That's efficacy. So climate changes and we get worried. Remember this? Here's where we break the mold. What do we do? We gather up everything we know and we can find out about what's happening where we live or how it's affecting our kids or if we both are people who kayak or bird or hike or we knit or we love food or beer or wine or we play tennis or we ski. Whoever we are, we look at who we are. And in Saving Us, I actually, in chapter two, take you through, you know, do an inventory of who you are and what you care about. And have a conversation with someone who shares that with you. Begin with what you have in common. Talk about how climate change affects what you both care about and share positive, constructive solutions at every scale. Tell them what the city of Guelph is doing. Tell them about um, what you've done yourself in your life. Tell them about what the university is doing. Tell them about what companies are doing. Tell them positive stories about what is being doing, what people are doing, and what happens. People feel empowered. They feel efficacy and action results. Why? Because that's the way we're wired. Let's go back to the neuroscience for just a second. And as Tali Sherat says in her book, The Influential Mind, the human brain is built to associate forward action with the reward not avoiding harm. So reframe your message so the information you provide induces what? Hope, not dread. Isn't that amazing? So who should I be talking to people say? You know, again, I feel like everybody around me feels the same way. Who should I be talking to? I feel like I just wanna make a beeline for those people I know who are absolutely convinced it isn't real. And yes, we have those people in Canada. Yes, we do. And I just want to tell those dismissive people that climate is changing, humans are responsible, the impacts are serious, and the time to act is now. I have some good news and some bad news. The bad news is 
is that people who are dismissive are only a small part of the population. In the United States, they're 8%. In Canada, I don't know. I would actually guess they're probably around the same number, to be totally honest, if you look across the whole country. They are the only ones we can't have a positive, constructive conversation with. Why not? Because they will dismiss anything and everything. They literally cannot listen because they're so convinced, not that the science isn't real. If they were really convinced the science isn't real, they wouldn't be using stoves or fridges or airplanes either because it's the same physics. They are totally convinced that there are no solutions that are consistent and compatible with their values and their ideology. And because of that, they will not admit it's real. They will not. But that's the bad news. What's the good news? The good news is, is 92% of us are not dismissive. And we absolutely can have positive conversations with the rest of us. The biggest gap we have, again, is not between the people who say it's real and it isn't real. The biggest gap we have that we can fill with conversation is between people who say it's real, but they don't think it matters to them, and people who say it's real, but, oops, people who say it's real, but they're not activated. And that's where our conversations can make the biggest difference. So I want to end with this. And now, don't forget to be putting your questions in pollev.com slash Catherine. If you don't mind putting that link in the chat one more time for people, you can go there and you can see all the questions people have asked so far. You can upvote the ones you most want me to get to in the time that we have together. We'll have about half an hour together to go through those questions. And you have about two more minutes to get your questions in there before we start. So pollev.com slash Catherine. But before I go there, I want to tell you why I wrote my book. And that is because wherever I went, whoever I spoke to, whether it was in Canada or the US or Australia or the UK, whether I was speaking to school kids or senior citizens or business leaders or church groups or universities, no matter where I went, I was hearing the same question again and again and again. It got to the point where I was hearing this question every single day. And that question was this, what gives you hope? What gives you hope? That's why I wrote this book. I wrote this book to answer the question, what gives you hope? And I want to define hope though, because for a lot of people today, hope is a bad word. People have put their hope in a single politician, a single technology, a single policy, a single action, and it's disappointed them because it always will. There is no single person or thing that will fix this problem for us. There is not but there's a lot of different solutions and a lot of different people and a lot of different policies that will all do a little bit and they'll all move us a little bit closer to that better future. So real hope is not a person, a policy or technology that's gonna fix it for us. Real hope is not just sort of putting your fingers in your ears or burying your head in the sand and saying, oh, it's all gonna be okay. Real hope begins in a dark place. Real hope says it's bad. And it's going to get worse. Real hope recognizes that success is not inevitable, nor even guaranteed. If success was guaranteed, we wouldn't need hope. The reason we need hope is because we know that we are at serious risk. We know we're conducting an unprecedented experiment with the only planet we have. We know that the possible outcome is disastrous, the end of human civilization as we know it. That is literally what is at risk. But we also know that a better future is possible. And real hope gives us a path to get there. It says if you try as hard as you can, there is a small bright light at the end of the tunnel. And if we fight towards that bright light, if we gather together and band together and hold each other's hands and have each other's backs, if we push forward towards that bright light at the end of the tunnel, you know what? There is a chance we could get there. And as long as there is that chance, I am not giving up. So as Greta Thunberg says, she says, the one thing we need more than hope is action. Why? Because once we start to act, hope is everywhere. Once we start to act, once we add our hand to the boulder, we look around and we're like, oh my goodness, there's 200 hands on this boulder right here. There's another 500 from Guelph alone. Once you get Kitchener and Waterloo in there, we've got a few thousand. There is so much hope when we look around and we see what's happening. And I want to end with these words that I wrote for an essay for Time magazine after the latest IPCC report came out a couple of months ago. 
I wrote this essay that talks about the power of conversation and the power of personal action, and this is how I ended it. Change, social change in our industrialized society did not begin when the King of England just sort of rolled out of bed one morning and decided to outlaw slavery. That's not how it happened. The President of the United States didn't wake up one morning and say, oh, I should give women the vote. The National Party of South Africa didn't just sort of say, oh, well, we should just end apartheid one day. No, change began when very ordinary people, people of no particular power or wealth or fame, decided that the world could and should be different. Who were William Wilberforce, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the Pankhurst sisters, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, and all the countless others whose names we don't know who shared and supported and fought for their visions of a better world. They were people who had the courage of their convictions, who did what? They used their voices to advocate for the systemic societal changes needed. We, we ordinary people, we're the people who changed the world before, and we are the people who can change it again. That's why climate change matters. That's why talking is so incredibly powerful. And that's why we must act, because quite literally, the future is in our hands. So what are we waiting for? It is up to us to save ourselves. And so that's why I called my book, Saving Us, A Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World. Thank you. Wow, Catherine, that was uh, that that was truly uh, inspirational, and I see that you're working away on those questions right away. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it back over to you because I think there were at least 21 questions the last time I looked in there, and people were upping and downing different ones. Um, I'll, I'll hand it back over to you. Okay. Well, before I get to the questions, before I forget, I mentioned a lot of resources to you. And so I would love to put those resources in the chat for people so that you could click on them to read them later if that's okay. So one of the ones I mentioned to you was I mentioned the Yale program on climate communication, uh, Canada maps, the maps of what people think about climate change by riding in Canada. So I'm going to put those in the chat right now. Oh, those are the older ones. Let me get the newer ones here. Okay. Here's the maps of uh, public opinion in Canada. Okay. And then I also mentioned George Marshall's book, Don't Even Think About It, How Your Brains Are Worried to, um, Your Brains Are Wired to Ignore Climate Change. Really interesting book. And let me see, get a link to that here. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Here we go. And then, last but not least, I also mentioned the fact that that Netflix movie, Don't Look Up, has a climate action site now. And I wanna show you that because I'm so excited about it and I'm actually gonna share my screen to show you um, this, this action website. So it says, love living on Earth but hate planet killing comets. Ready to stop freaking out and start doing something. So there's no comment, but the climate crisis is real and it's happening now. The good news is we can do something about it. Join millions of people stepping up to do what? Talk about it. Join a climate group. Make your money count. Keep our politicians accountable. Spark ideas at work. Push for climate headlines. And yes, there absolutely are personal actions that we can take in our lives. If you click on see all steps, it should come up. And when we look at those person, oh wow, they've got... Uh, almost a quarter of a million people who are taking action. And when you click on, the, on taking the, the, the personal steps, we've got cut food waste, eat more veggies, switch to clean energy, get around greener, fly less. And then what do you wanna do? Of course, you wanna talk about it, right? So here's the Netflix website. Please check it out, click on it, share. And if there's any other resource um, that you need, um, I will put it in here too. So I think the links I put in are clickable to me. Um, so you could click on them and open them in a browser, but also I think Rasha just said that she can circulate some of these also afterwards. Okay, so let's get to the questions. And why don't I, Evan, if you don't mind, I'm gonna pass it to you. Um, why don't you go ahead and take a look at the questions? I think the top one has 18 votes. Why don't you sort of you know pick some questions that you want us to take?
Certainly, I have to remember to unmute here. Let me just jump in there. And I notice, um, I'm gonna to jump to the first one that I see here with a lot of numbers. What do we, we've got 12 people that have voted for this one. How do we get people to see that even making small changes like reducing waste makes a difference? Mm -hmm. So um, if you click on top, you can see them in order that way from the, from the most upvoted. So small changes make a difference if we do it together. So the best thing to do is to look for examples that sort of are like, okay, if enough people did this, here's the impact it would have. So for example, you know, if every household replaced one light bulb, that would be the equivalent of taking, you know, 50,000 cars off the road or something like that. So you can sort of say, if, if everybody does this action, here's the impact it has at the national scale. And there's websites that have those types of equivalencies there. Like if everybody did X, what would that be like in terms of, you know, number of cars or in terms of planting number of trees or something like that. But what's the biggest impact of what we do? It is not our carbon footprint. It's our climate shadow. Our climate shadow is how we influence our city, our place of work, an organization we're part of, our school, our university to take action. So let me tell you, give you an example of that. Imagine if you decide you're going to cut your food waste. That's great. Imagine if you bring it up with the cafeteria at your school and you get a few other people on board and you help figure out a program for your school to do that. And imagine if the whole cafeteria cuts its food waste. We're talking about not just a personal carbon footprint. We're talking about a huge climate shadow. That's how having those conversations matter. And of course, reducing our own food waste is important. It's not sufficient though, we need to engage our voice. And there's a really cool article that explains this whole concept of a climate shadow. I'm gonna put that in the chat too, so you can read about it. Um, because it's kind of a new concept. We're all sort of focused on our carbon footprint, but our climate shadow is really, really important. Okay, there we go. All right, next question. How do you respond to a resistance to reducing extraction and use of fossil fuels based on the argument that we're never going to get away from using fossil fuels? Mm -hmm. I would say uh, people might have said we're never going to get away from using horses and buggies or we're never going to get away from using party line telephones. If you look at almost every piece of technology that we have ever used, we have always moved on with gratitude, which I think is important. Fossil fuels have brought us tremendous benefits. If you look at what our lives were like 200 years ago, I'm a little fuzzy here trying to fix that there. If you look at what our lives were like 200 years ago and what they're like today, they have changed radically for the better, in large part thanks to fossil fuels. But just like some of our medicines have terrible side effects, in the same way fossil fuels have some terrible side effects that have been building up over time. And that's why it's time to transition to clean sources of energy. There's some ways that we can transition a lot more quickly, like in the electricity sector. There's other places like in heavy fuels that's gonna take a bit longer. We might always be using oil for some things, but I'm pretty sure that in about 50 years, people will be like, you used to burn that stuff? Are you insane? <laughs> we can use these resources for different purposes, but we don't need to use them for a lot of our energy already today and in the future, we won't have to use them for energy at all because we will have different ways to get energy. And that's just the way the world works. Catherine, can I give a couple of wealth examples of that? Oh, on, the waste, on, on, the, on the waste management side, I thought yes. uh, a, a really good thing to remind people of is that in the early 80s, we didn't have a blue box program. Mm -hmm. And it was for a family and then a larger group of individuals and a larger group of individuals until it started becoming a movement and the environmental group started getting involved. And eventually we wound up with a three stream waste uh, reduction system that had one of the highest uh, waste reduction uh, targets in the country. So uh, I mean, we, we have a lot of examples here. Uh, water reduction uh, um, um, is, is yet another one there. Here's another one. Um, what is the most promising climate action you see happening right now that could help turn things around? Um, well, I'm actually going to say the fact that a lot more people are talking about it now. I mean, mm -hmm. you had a major international movie hit that was completely about climate change that wasn't a documentary that has been nominated for four Academy Awards. You have a huge increase in media coverage of everything from the um, Fridays for Future uh, Young People's Climate Marches 
to the impacts of climate change right here in Canada and how it's affecting us, to climate solutions that are coming out every day. So there's a lot more coverage about it. There's a lot more attention being paid to it. There's a lot more action happening. And it's gone from being this thing that nobody ever really talked about to just in the last couple of years, it's gotten to the point where you have to be living under a rock not to have heard about how it's affecting us and why it matters. And we're starting, we aren't quite enough yet, but we're starting to hear more about what we can do to fix it. So to me, that's one of the most encouraging things is just realizing that people are finally starting to get that it isn't a niche issue, that it isn't an environmental issue alone, that you don't only have to be an environmentalist to care about it. And one of the most encouraging things for me when I went to Glasgow in November to the, the COP26 climate meeting was that, yes, there were all the different country negotiators there, but they were only a tiny fraction of all the people who were there. Who else was there? People from every single walk of life. There were young people. One of the most hopeful people I met there was an 11 year old climate activist from Colombia. There were heads of major corporations like Amazon and Ikea and Unilever, and they were there because they wanted to implement sustainable action within their companies. There were theologians there. There were indigenous peoples there. There were people from every walk of life and every age, from literally babies to senior citizens and everybody in between. It was a representation to me, a microcosm of why climate change matters. Everybody was there because climate change mattered to them, but everybody was there because climate change mattered to them in a different way. And I feel like the penny is finally starting to drop that whoever you are, you already have every reason to care about climate change. And that to me is incredibly encouraging. Instead of being siloed over here in the sustainability bin at a university or at a city or at a company, they're starting to realize climate change truly is an everything issue. And the way I think about it is it's the hole in the bucket. So whoever we are, we have one or more buckets we're trying to fill, right? Goals we're trying to accomplish, problems we're trying to fix. Climate change is the hole in the bottom of every single bucket. So again, to care about climate change, like that t-shirt said, you don't have to be a certain type of person. You just have to be a human living on planet Earth. And I feel like people are starting to get it. And that is the most encouraging thing that I've seen in the last few years. Here's a, here's a tough one. How do you not give up and keep hope? So in my book, I talk about this. I talk about how hope does not come to find you. We have to go out and look for it. If we sit and wait for hope to come, we're not going to find it. We have to practice hope, almost like a muscle, <laughs> to make it stronger and more resilient. We have to practice active hope where we actually go out and we look for reasons to be hopeful. And we find that hope often in what other people are doing, in what we're doing ourselves, in actions that have already been taken, in actions that are being taken, in actions that are being planned. We find that hope through looking at what we can do and what is being done. So actually, if you don't mind, I'm actually gonna read a little excerpt from the book. This comes from near the end of the book. It says, where my hope comes from. Real hope doesn't usually come knocking at the door of our brains uninvited. What comes knocking at the door of our brains, I'll tell you, if you scroll down the headlines, is doom. If you scroll down the headlines of most major news sites, there are stories that frustrate you, that make you angry, that make you depressed, or that are just factual. But it, we, if we want hope, we have to go out and look for it. It's not going to knock at the door of our brains. If we want to find it, we have to roll up our sleeves and go out and look for it. And if we do, chances are we'll find it. And then we have to practice it. The idea of hope as a practice, rather than emotion or a value, has ancient roots in Buddhist philosophy. In their book, Active Hope, How to Face the Mess We're In Without Going Crazy, philosopher Joanna Macy and psychologist Chris Johnstone write, that active hope is a practice like Tai Chi or gardening. It's something we do rather than something we have. First, take a clear view of reality, right? Second, identify what we hope for, a better future. Third, take steps to move ourselves in that direction. And rather than waiting until we feel hopeful, focus on our intention and let that be our guide. So that's what I do. I make a practice of hope. I search for and collect and share stories and good news about people who are making a difference, about tech innovations like solar fabric, 
about floating solar farms and flooded open pit coal mines, about river powered energy in remote Arctic villages and more. I participate in events and I partner with organizations that share my values and promote advocacy and action from museums and teacher programs to faith-based initiatives. I offer them what I have. It might be my expertise or my time or a donation or a skill. And speaking personally for myself, I look to my faith because the provenance for hope, the Bible says, is not what we might think. It's not in rosy circumstances and positive conditions. It doesn't arrive when everything is going our way. In um, St. Paul's epistle to the Romans, it says, we know that troubles help us learn not to give up. When we have learned not to give up, it shows us we have stood the test. And when we have stood the test, it gives us hope. And this doesn't mention courage, but it runs through the whole verse. It takes courage to persevere under suffering. Courage is part of character and therefore courage is an essential ingredient of rational, constructive hope. And I love how the verse ends. Hope never makes us ashamed because the love of God has come into our hearts. And in general, love casts out fear and love casts out shame as well. It's the glue that binds us humans together when every other force in the world, it seems, is trying to divide us into smaller and smaller tribes. Science tells us it's too late to avoid all the impacts of climate change because some of them are here today. Others are inevitable because of the past choices we've made and that can make us afraid. But the research I do is clear. It is not too late to avoid the most serious and dangerous impacts. Our choices will determine what happens. The future we face will be forged by our actions. And I close the chapter with a quote from one of my colleagues, Catherine Wilkinson. She says, it is a magnificent thing to be alive in a moment that matters so much. What a wonderful way to end it. <laughs> that was that was uh, just fantastic, uh, Catherine. I I, I, I can't I, I, just, I just can't help uh, but thank you enough. I'm I'm speechless, which is doesn't happen very often. I have to say, <laughs> this is something that's been so so near and dear to our heart. And if people are looking at for things to do, uh, we have all sorts of things going on. If you're a woman out there and you're interested in EVs, we've got an EV. Um, but, uh, an EV event just for women. We have our home tune-up to help people in, in homes uh, in a myriad of different ways. Do you have time for one more question, Catherine? Um, sure, and what I'll do is, some people were saying links didn't work out, out but I'm trying to put links in here that work, okay. Um, I have time for one more question and I'll, I'll make a suggestion to people too. Um, what I'm doing um, in the next day or two is I'm putting discussion questions to go with the book on my website. And then I'm also making short videos to go with each section. Why? So that if you want to start a conversation by hosting a book discussion, I will give you all the materials you need. I will give you questions that you can ask. I will give you little videos that you can watch with each section. And that would be a way to have a discussion with people, to have that conversation. And again, one that focuses on hope. So go ahead, last question, Evan. All yours. Last question I, I thought was a, just sort of a sideways question here, but I thought it was very interesting. How do you avoid being the person that no one wants to talk to because you're always talking about climate change? Uh, I avoid that by talking, by not talking to people. Mm -hmm. If you are always lecturing people, if you are always hectoring people, if you're always dumping scary doom filled facts on people, no wonder people are heading for the exits when they see you coming. But if you are somebody who genuinely engages with people, who listens to them, who understands what they care about, who empathizes with that, and who brings hope to the table and says, yeah, I worry about that too. Yeah, no wonder you're concerned about that. Or yes, I was excited about that as well. Bond over something you share. Connect the dots to climate change. So, you know, you may be passionate about fishing, but somebody else isn't. You're not going to have a long conversation about how climate change affects fishing with the person who couldn't care less, right? Consider what they care about. Have a conversation about mutual interests. Connect the dots to climate and always, always bring up a hopeful, positive fact that will leave them feel encouraged, empowered, and with a sense of efficacy that they can pass on to the next person they talk to as well. And on that note, I'm going to hand uh, the virtual lectern back over to my colleague, uh, Rasha, for some last words, Catherine. Rasha, over to you. Thanks, Evan. 
what an inspiring speech, Catherine. <laughs> you made me speechless uh, tonight. So uh, with this, everyone, we reach to the end of our event. Uh, special thanks to Catherine Hayo uh, for her great presentation and her powerful statements and words. Lots of lessons learned from her expertise in communicating climate change over these years. Big thanks to all of our attendees for their engagement and interaction. And finally, many thanks to The Bookshelf for sponsoring this event. Uh, I invite you to read Catherine's latest book, Saving Us, which is available at The Bookshelf now. Good night, everyone, and see you in our upcoming events. Stay tuned. Bye-bye.